Alrighty then. Um, well, welcome to our um, recorded lecture. Um, so it is currently 2.13 p.m. on Sunday. We're going to the hospital in a few hours. I mean, it's going to be like eight hours, but um, uh, super, super excited. Um, just praying everything goes well for both mama and the boy. Um, so... Um, I forget what I was, I was going to say. <laughs> I do appreciate you guys, you know, sitting through with me on this. I'll tell you this. Uh, I'll skip just a moment and say there was a video that I was going to stream on here, record, that's like 12 minutes long, that's going to cover something that I think it was just going to be a lot more concise, visually impressive, or visually um, yeah, impressive, we'll stick with the word, um, and that I want, I was going to stream and I was going to watch it with you, but I've had to record lectures for two other classes. You guys are my third and I've had videos, shorter videos for each of them and it comes up really choppy. So I'm going to ask you at some point for you to please pause. You're going to have access to this whole lecture. You're going to have access to the link of that video. And so I'm going to ask you to please pause the, vid the lecture and watch that one 11 minute video. Um, so what you need to do for participation and to get credit for this class is that you need to just watch the whole lecture um, and, you know, if you need to kind of listen to it and move around a little bit, but fine, I mean, it's your life. But you need to be able to take some handwritten notes to just show that you listen to the whole thing. I just need to see handwritten notes to show the whole thing uh, uh, or typed. So it just you then need to just email it to me either way. So if you hand wrote them, take a picture of them, set them in an email, that's fine. Or if you type them, just save it as a doc, send it to me, that is fine as well. And just show me that you... And took notes throughout. Um, it's just that that video that I'm going to have you guys watch is also part of the notes. Um, now I'm going to go over a lot of what it covered and give you some just additional details, going a little bit of depth here and there when I find when you know when I decided that it was important. But you still need to watch that. It is like like I said, I think the video itself is 12 minutes, but then you also skip the first minute. The first minute of it is a total advertisement built in. It's not the kind of like YouTube commercial. So. You're going to skip like the first 70, 80 seconds, something like that. So it's really only about 10 to 11 minutes long. But then you're going to just treat that as part of the lecture. So anyway, we are beginning topic four. I mean, think about that. We are now, when this topic is over, we will be over halfway through the semester. I mean, that's crazy. Halfway through the semester. It's nuts. Um, so just, you know, keep that in mind, you know, as you're pacing yourself, just make sure everything is going the way you want it to go, getting that A that I know every one of us can get, um, that, you know, time is kind of flying. It's kind of flying. So just uh, let me know if you need anything when I get back. I'm only missing, you know, one class. We're only doing this once. Um, and so uh, then I will see you on, what is today? Or what, what day do we meet? On Wednesdays and Fridays. So then I'll see you over Zoom on Friday. All right, here we go. Okay, I was like, wait a second, what is it? So this is the next assignment. <laughs> the next assignment, you're going to write a 1,250-word essay again. You're just, I just want you to answer the prompts, comparing the responses of China and Japan to 19th century challenges from the West. Include the following background of differences between China and Japan that explain their unique responses. Overview of the major events between the West and those two countries circa 1800, 1870, and an analysis of the results in both countries that stem from their respective choices. So more on that later. Ignore the date. The date is wrong. But it is worth, that's from last semester. Forgot to change it. But it's worth 120 points. All right, so just so you know, you guys did kind of go over this a little bit on Friday um, already, uh, but I'm going to just go over it kind of briefly, just real quick. I just want to make sure that we hit on a couple issues and just really focus on the British East India Company. So as we did discuss last week, the British East India Company was formed by the Queen um, as a federal monopoly over trade in India. They were going to be the only ones. But one of the things that she stipulated was that she could, was that the British East India Company also acted, they were a company, but they also acted as a military arm because they had the right to fight, you know, in a warlike sense over goods and territory required to collect goods. So it, it's this just really, really thing. Imagine Apple. Today, I mean, it's, it's kind of the equivalent. Imagine Apple today not only having a federal monopoly over that kind of technology, cell phone technology, um, you know, like MP3 player technology, computers technology, um, obviously, obviously operating systems, having a federal monopoly, and then also having a military assigned to it to be able to control its assets. That's, that's literally a comparison. 
I mean, that's a legitimate. Imagine Walmart having this similar kind of federal monopoly, or you know, AMC for movies having a similar monopoly. I mean, that's just nuts. And yet, that's exactly what the British did. So between 1857, uh, 1757, and 1857, the East, the English East India Company went from being mainly a commercial corporation to seizing direct or indirect control over all of India because the charter gave them the right to to exert such military power. Just It's just mind-blowing that this was ever a thought, and yet it was. Not a, just a thought, but it existed. Um, eventually, over their total control, over the, the, the bulk of their control, it totaled roughly a, a million and a half square miles, 1.5 million square miles. This made it bigger than any other empire in India's history, and it was a business. It was an art, an area about as large as all of Western Europe, and it was a business. It was a co- imagine. <laughs> it just kind of makes you laugh. Imagine Apple controlling Mexico, and it was the company of Apple that was in control of the, co- the country of Mexico, and in control of leadership, and in control of taxes, and collecting taxes, and raising taxes, and killing people. It's just it's it's insanity, and yet it existed. It happened. Uh, India had a substantially larger population than the British East India Company, uh, at least 270 million people around the year of 1800. So in the hundreds of millions throughout, you know, in East, British East Indian Company's control, um, they obviously had now like 1.2, 1.3, 1.4 billion. Ironically, most uh, many members of the parliament believed that it was against British interests and morality to conquer an empire in Asia, and yet the company did it. And there were enough people on their side that allowed the charter to continue. However, there were, obviously, there were then populations who wanted to increase British power in the world, especially against competing European countries like France. And by the mid-19th century, the 1800s, British imperialists had largely come to prevail over those British politicians who consulted restraint. So over time, a growing number of artisans, servants, and soldiers found employment, Indian artisans and servants and soldiers found employment with the Europeans, uh, thus developing and then eventually the company would preserve a relationship with the English as their control became began to become more and more dominant. Some developed mutually profitable arrangements with the East, English East Indian Company, um, or Indian, but whatever, from uh, early after its arrival. I mean, it's, it's kind of like if aliens were to come to the Earth right now and start to uh, exert control, wouldn't there be some humans who would be like, you know, hey, I'm going to try to save my life and, and find a way to be mutually um, compatible. Uh, these classes sometimes even sided the British against their own repressive Indian rulers. Although, again, I mean, often it was just to save their own lives. You know, just they're, they're willing to do anything to just save their lives. Uh, there were a diverse, there were diverse Indian rulers and warlords competing for power. Ultimately, regarded who were ultimately regarded the Europeans as potential sources for plunder, or else allies whose armies they could rent. Sorry, this is so small, uh, but again, I'm trying to fly through this because you guys have already. You know, gone over this. But most of India was either under regionally based kings or Mughal Islamic rule successor states. The Mughals began before the British East India Company, by the way, if you didn't know this, which you should have, because we've been discussing it the last two weeks. Anyway, so for example, in 1756, Siraj uh, Ud Dalau, uh, who was only 23 and inherited his grandfather's position as Nawab or Mughal governor over the rich province, province of Bengal. And he was effectively an independent king. One of his first acts was to attack the English East India Company's outpost in Calcutta. He seized money and goods, driving off many of the hapless Britons. Um, rumors were greatly exaggerated as to the number of British prisoners who were caught and died. But what it did is, you know, think um, the American shot heard around the world, or excuse me, uh, not the shot heard around the world, but the, um, the um, Boston Massacre the events were greatly exacerbated in order to spin and gain more in American um, kind of anger and angst towards the British. Well, the same thing kind of happened here. Brits then spun the number of people died, uh, British Brits that died and those who died in prison just to be able to garner more more um, energy and excitement towards it. Energy, excitement, obviously, in like an angry way and then bring more force. So Indian mercenary soldiers or sepoys were sent with British soldiers to regain Calcutta. About 800 British soldiers and 22 sepoys were placed up against Siraj's army of about 50,000 men. English General Robert Clive bribed one of the opposing generals, Mir Jafar, promising to make him the new Nawab of Bengal if he would betray his master and also pay him up to 20 million rupees. This guy would have just been uberly powerful. 
Part of the money went to the East India Company. Much of it also went to Clive personally. The company also demanded and received. It, they they won, by the way. The, the English won. Uh, the company also demanded and received a trade monopoly over some of the more profitable and prestigious project products in the region. The most famous battle was June 23rd, 1757, the Battle of Plassey, which really was more bribery than actual fighting, because, again, this was when Mir Jafar um, you know, was offered this, but he was hunted down and executed, uh, and then, or excuse me, he hunted down, then executed the Nawab Siraj. So there we go. So the East India Company's officials in India had thus suddenly seized vast power and wealth in Bengal, and they used Mir Jafar as their kind of puppet leader. After the Battle of Plessy, the English East, English, uh, English East India Company controlled an area three times the size of England and far more densely populated, which means a lot more money. This is a company. Again, remember, or consider, uh, or, 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 or again, use the idea of Apple going into Mexico City and taking over control. It's That's what happened. Additionally, the company collected and kept most of the tax money from Bengal. See, they raised taxes. From that point onward, the East India Company was able to take enough from its trade of monopolies and the taxes it collected from Bengal so that it could purchase all the Indian project products it wanted and still ship home additional gold and silver, um, producing a huge um, trade benefit to the East India Company. Ironically, despite the imperial moves by the company, British Parliament passed the 1784 India Act, which forbade formal formal British imperial moves into India, which meant that the actual military could not uh, imperialize. Uh, it was based on the continued idea that it was immoral to colonize Asia. The act asserted that, quote, to pursue schemes of conquest and extension of dominion in India are measures repugnant to the wish, the honor, and the policy of this nation, that of England, it shall not be lawful for companies, officials in India, either to declare war or commence hostilities or enter into any treaty for making war against any of the princes or states in India in order to, uh, it, this was written to rein in an R-E-I-G-N, so wrong reign, in the company. Uh, despite this, for the ensuing decades of many decades, British officials in India continued to launch wars and seize lands without direct parliamentary oversight or control, which they would, annexing larger and larger, larger swaths of the country. Now, remember opium. Remember opium was brought into China, which caused uh, a lot of problems. It was brought in by the English via India. So in order to increase the government's income in the late 1820s, and it was around this time, it was declared all opium grown in British India had to be sold to the company at the prices that the company set to guarantee uh, an opium monopoly. And, this, and profits. So this meant very large profits when the company auctioned off that opium to British, Indian, and American merchants who then smuggled it into China, as we discussed, to the growing millions of addicts there. This trade began only at about half a million pounds of opium shipped and sold in 1820, but rose to 13.4 million pounds annually in 1880. I mean, that is a lot of this drug. While the Chinese imperial government tried to stop this illegal smuggling. The British Navy twice defeated the Opium Wars, again, which we discussed. And the acquisition of Hong Kong was also part of the British conquest, which would not go back to the Chinese, well, would not then remain, I guess, no, it did go back to the Chinese in, the, in 2000. And it's kind of been over in, in um, uh, Chinese control since. Um, overall, during this century of East India Company expansion, while many Indians lost their lives and lost everything, others adjusted and survived, and some even prospered, again, kind of working with their, um, with their overlords. Um, after, actually, just using that word overlord reminds me of a Simpsons. Oh, here, let me, give me a second. Hold on, this is going to be a funny anecdote. All right, so there was a Simpsons where Homer became a, an astronaut. And so, again, in a reference to, I just love adding pop culture whenever I can, in reference to those um, Indians who managed to prosper under British East India rule, many of them did so by just kind of accepting their position as subordinate and then working with the British to, um, to survive. And it was, in essence, it was just to survive. So they could make some money. You know, and some could make a lot of money, but they would obviously then never have control. They were always under the English thumb, but at least they were kind of able to survive and prosper. So in this case, 
the, in this kind of um, pop culture reference, in The Simpsons, Homer goes to space. He's an astronaut. He's just an average citizen astronaut. And uh, if you've never seen this before, and while up there, you know, the blundering Homer Simpson of Earth is a blundering Homer Simpson in space, and he accidentally breaks a glass ant colony um, right before they are supposed to broadcast to the world, um, you know, just greetings, which happens, you know, the ISS and the space shuttle all the time. They'll, they'll just do broadcasts. And being that he was an average citizen, um, it was going to be broadcast on every station. So he blunders, he accidentally breaks an ant colony, you know, ant farm. They were just going to just test the effects of zero gravity on the ants. And that is how we enter this scene. I'm not going to watch the whole minute 21, just I think it's like 45 seconds. Sorry, and it's going to be skippy. I do apologize, but, you know, it'll be the listening is the funny part. We're just about to get our first pictures from inside the spacecraft with average, not Homer Simpson. And we'd like to... Ah! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've just lost the picture, but uh, what we've seen speaks for itself. The Corvair spacecraft has apparently been taken over, conquered, if you will, by a master race of giant space ants. <laughs> it's difficult to tell from this vantage point whether they will consume the captive Earth man or merely enslave them. One, One thing, thing is, is for certain, certain, there is no stopping them. The ants will soon be here. And I, for one, welcome our new insect overlords. I'd like to remind them that as a trusted TV personality, uh, I can be helpful in rounding up others to toil in their underground <laughs> sugar caves. Mm. Don't worry, kids. Oops, so again, that is a reference to those uh, Indians who um, kind of utilized positions that they any any way they could to survive and benefit under this control. So that's the joke. All right. So what did I leave off? Some okay. So after centuries of quasi dynamic leadership with many kings and rulers at any one time, and thus no pervasive sense of being part of an Indian nation. Employment did not seem traitorous, but rather the best option when available. So employment by the English. Uh, so gradually, as the company's government, you know, air quote government, and the British economy gained power, many more Indians suffered. So, for example, raw cotton grown in India went to British cloth mills with the finished product being sold back to Indians. This put most profit into British hands, while most Indian weavers were then left unemployed. Britons made even more conf confident assertions to the religion uh, and, Christ uh, and culture, too, and even their race was superior to the Indians as well. Indian sepoys, those, again, those Indian soldiers who fought on behalf of the British, felt undervalued, and Indian rulers were deposed, so British economic, culture, and political assertions increasingly clashed with Indian um, interests. So, the, again, you guys kind of covered that. I just really wanted to just kind of hit on that real quick. So, now, in terms of the age of reform, British attitudes towards Indians. Wait a second, have I hit pause? Oh, good, I'm recording. <laughs> Whew, all right, I just wanted to make sure all this. And I'm like, wait a second, did I hit pause after, or unpause after the video? So, British attitudes towards Indians started to become more condescending after the 1840s. A newer generation of officers, those who were not there in that initial push in which the British East India Company was not in, you know, they, they knew they weren't there to conquer. This newer generation of officers and company servants wanted to remake India in their own image, making it more modern, which then also meant more European, hence in their own image. Would not only make it easier and more cost efficient to govern, but also more, they hoped, amenable to or amendable to the British Empire. In other words, again, what they were doing was still against the law, yet they were doing it and they wanted to just garner more and more support for their actions. Because then it also for those for those officers who were still making a lot of money, those those Britons who were making a lot of money as officers and soldiers, they wanted to continue to make more and more money for themselves and you know, garner more power and influence and notoriety and so forth. So it was believed that law, education, and free trade could transform the Indians. Although it's free trade with the Britons, so not really free. Religion too, the Great Awakening affected the if you recall the Great Awakening from um, American history, it affected the British, and in 1813, the Parliament amended the company charter to allow British Christian missionaries to the continent, continent as well. So now they could go in and start really converting Indians over from Hindu to Christianity. <coughs> Excuse me. British attitudes to... Oops, doodles, that's the same. Okay, so uh, so I got a typo there. So these missionaries brought, starting here, the then traditional fire and brimstone philosophies of Christian indoctrination 
oh gosh, I got a great quote I didn't add in here, but it was just the idea of, you know, like God can um, cause you to float and he is allowing you to stay on the ground because the, the, the way you act, the damnation really is like a weight, uh, an iron weight built, you know, like as built into your body, dragging you towards the hellish core, you know. So that was often how Christianity was, was taught, was that very specific for right or, for, you know, right or wrong, better or worse. This, they whipped up contempt to uh, these missionaries for Hinduism and, of course, Islam, who Christians have been fighting pretty, you know, but to this point, pretty regularly for the past 1800, well, not 1800 years, but, you know, 1500 years or so, whenever the, or 1200 years. So the reaction was a combination of resentment, primarily from Muslims, and fear, primarily from Hindus, who feared becoming social out outcasts based on the already very strict caste system in place, that the British didn't break down, and that the Mughals had reinforced over their generations of power. In 1853, or, I mean, they still had kind of had some power here, but very, very little. It was more of just kind of their generations of, of dominance. In 1835, the English were was replaced. The English, excuse me, was replaced by Persian uh, as the official language of India. Arthur and liberal reformer Tom, Thomas Babing, Babington Macaulay uh, wrote of the subject that quote a single good shelf of a European library was worth the whole native literature of India and Arabia. We must be present to do our best to reform a class who may be interpreters between us and the millions who we govern. Class of persons, Indian blood and color, but English and in taste, in opinions, in morals, and in intellect. This was significant. Actually, I have that wrong. Persian was replaced by English. Uh, this was significant because Indians might start learning English, which was part of the goal. In doing so, they would be exposed to the broader level of English in Western curriculum, i.e. philosophers such as John Locke, John Milton, the, uh, the Greek typo, sorry, and Roman classics, and then of philosophy, science, and even European history. So there were, the idea was very much indoctrination. Learn our language, read our books, become one of us. Um, so with this in place, thousands of schools and colleges filled with the English language curriculum began to sprout up. And this is why India would eventually become one of the largest English-speaking populations in the world, which they are still to this day. Um, okay, so the Sepoy Revolt of 1857, the Indian Mutiny, and the First War of Independence. Uh, this is the video I want you to watch. So it's right here. I will, when I attach this lecture, I will also upload the PowerPoint so you can click on it. So when you get to uh, the lecture, please click on this uh, link. Again, it is, it's about 12 minutes long, but the first minute or so a uh, minute, a few seconds is um, an advertisement, just a straight up ad. Um, so just fast forward through that, find the point. It is a cartoon, and that's one of the reasons why I choose this. Is there's of course no video of this. Um, I'm not. There's no picture. Uh, I'm sure there are. No, 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 there are pictures. Excuse me, but there are very, very few. And so uh, that's why this I like so much. So please hit pause right now. Click on that link. Go to the PowerPoint, or if you want to just copy, you know, type this. You can't copy and paste because it's going to be a video. Uh, and watch this video. So hit pause, and we're back. So what I'm going to do here is I'm now going to go over a lot of what that video discussed, but I'm going to kind of skim over it, reinforce, get some details that it didn't add, and then just hit on some information that, that, is, that is particularly important. So um, now, in the 1810s, a steady stream of Christian missionaries theologically assaulted, as we discussed, Hinduism and Islam and it's to this unprecedented degree. Um, so many Indians, including the Scythias, who served the company, felt honestly that their religions were under attack, and they truly were. Some British officers even allowed missionaries to preach openly in the barracks of these Indian soldiers, which obviously at that point then, um, you know, was really kind of true indoctrination. Or, as was sometimes said by the Indians, quote, the company has plundered our lands, and now they want to plunder our souls. We don't use the word plunder enough. I like to pillage and plunder. <laughs> So since this was happening at a high point of British imperial and global power, the British were slow to understand this reaction. They were often blinded by their own arrogance. We know that throughout history. So we're going to quickly look at some of the financial resentment and grievances. Uh, so the company's military and political ambitions were always greater than their physical resources, and loyal Indian soldiers were then were now at this point being asked to foot the bill, work less, make or work more, make less. And this, to the wretched, this added to this wretched uh, situation of the agrarian economy of peasants and cultivators who were dirt poor. And we can then see in hindsight that the economic 
that the economic discontent was both felt and very, very real by many in India. Company rule and reform, as of the 1820s, brought visibly modernizing effects. British law courts, government officials, telegraph, railways, and British commerce, none of which were instituted to help and better the lives of the Indians, though all of which were instituted to better the company, the company's well-being, and any benefit that Indians might have received was secondary to the company's gain. Now, there's also a spat of rapid annexations uh, from the late 1830s, which startled, unsettled, which started unsettled many regions the British had, which started, wait, which started to bring in more unsettled regions which the British had not yet touched. That's what I was trying to say. It was very poorly worded, sorry. So the company's governor general between 1842 and 44, Lord Ellenborough, go to the, the Sindhi leaders or emirs into a humiliating treaty in 1843. If you want to learn more, you can totally Google that. Um, I was going to add more, and there actually is more in the speaker notes here if you want to read it from here, but it's very interesting. It's just, it's so long, and I just didn't want to focus too much on it. I wanted to focus on the treaty stipulation. They just annex more land, and, and they go to them to this humiliating treaty um, that s said that that land could be further and permanently annexed by the English if the emirs were proven to have been disloyal. Well, define disloyal. <laughs> and so this was broadly defined, obviously, and did so in favor of the company. It gave the emirs very, very little leeway if they did anything, if, if the company basically just decided, yep, you know, we want this land, we want to act annex the land, boom, they just said, oh, you know, you and Mira did this, they could make up something, and voila, they annexed the land that they the English took, the company took complete control. They very much knew that the Sindhir emirs would eventually rebel, further giving the British the pretext to annex, because the second you, you know, you rebel, you are obviously therefore disloyal, and thus, <laughs> voila, we're going to take your land. So the British, the British therefore created through this something called the, quote, doctrine of lapse that stated that Indian kings could not produce a biological male, that if an Indian king, excuse me, could not produce a biological male heir, the company would then take over. Now, this also, this breached the long-standing tradition that allowed Hindu kings to adopt a male heir, which then would allow at least the name uh, to continue, even if it was not a specific bloodline. Well, in this case, the company said, nope, if you can't produce an heir, then you can't, you know, we take control. So it's another uh, um, um, means of, of annexing. So the doctrine of, of lapse set the pretext for the company's rapid annexation of a series of smaller kingdoms, such as Satura in 1848, Jhansi in 1853, and Nagpur in 1854, and then last and most significantly was the annexation of Awad in 1856 on a fairly spurious claim of maladministration that again vaguely echoed the doctrine of lapse. This annexation was the last kerosene-soaked rag thrown in the pile before Indian sepais uh, lit the spark of the eventual uprising of 1857, which again, I'm just going to cover very lightly here. Um, that you, but you know, just kind of reinforce some stuff and give some additional information, um, but that you did see in the video. So this uprising, uprising started in Barakpur in March of 1557, just before the summer heat, which could be miserable over there. Uh, so Mangal Pandi of the 34th Native Infantry ran amok one evening, and this was not included in the video, but while high on bang, which is marijuana mixed with milk. <laughs> He tried to, relate, to, 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 to raise a religious-based revolt against the British and attacked his British officers. He was arrested, of course, failed. He failed to create the uprising, was arrested and hanged. Milk will do that to you. So after this event, the term pandy was used by the British to describe as a verb any mutineer or rebel. Events really took off, however, in Meerut two months later in May, right as the summer heat was really starting to kick in. The company had introduced a new Enfield rifle for soldiers sometime in April. Now, there were some rumors uh, among the soldiers that the cartridges were greased with swine and cow fat, which uh, consumption of was, so cow was not to be consumed by the Hindus, and, and pig fat, swine fat, was not to be consumed by Muslims. So it was really just kind of the theory um, or the rumor was that this was really to dig into the religious um, offenses of both faiths. So even though the British likely didn't do this, um, and they were likely just greased with linseed oil and beeswax, it didn't matter. The rumor went enough, you know, was strong enough to persuade um, 
Hindu and Muslim soldiers to interpret this as confrontation or confirmation of the clandestine pot to convert to convert India, excuse me, to Christianity, or at least undermine the Hindu and Muslim religious beliefs. So tapping into existing resentment, the Sophia or the Sapis uh, soon overran most of northern India with arms and company authority quickly disappeared along, uh, uh, across large swaths in the north. Uh, the Sophias marched to Delhi and proclaimed the aged Mughal emperor uh, ba- uh, Bahadur, uh, gosh, Bahadur Shah Zafar as emperor of Hindustan. One mutineer told him bluntly, Old man, we have made you king. The Mughal emperor was still a symbol of sovereignty and one that could theoretically mobilize the masses. Soon, this, uh, the newly installed British administration of Awada or of Awad were gone. Was gone. Oops, I forgot to erase. Um, so, beginning here. But the uprising and Great Rebellion was also compli- complicated by its limited geographical scope. Bengal, Bombay, Madras, and Punjab, all very important trading and economic centers, were relatively quiet with very little uprising of any kind. These uprisings were very limited. Um, as I said right here, geographically, but I mean, they were also limited into just small regions. Uh, Bengal, in particular, had a large military presence, and English-educated Bengalis looked down upon their northern neighbors as provincial hillbillies. Uh, The Punjab was also recently annexed, so it had a large presence of British military officers that were there still to um, occupy the city. So in an ironic fit of revenge... Punjabi soldiers helped quash a rebellion by the very Safis who had helped the British conquer the Punjab back in the 1840s. So, you know, again, you're working for your masters just to survive. Well, the British were very unhappy about these um, about these uh, uprisings. And so the British made very dramatic examples of those who rebelled. They sometimes wrapped Muslim rebels in pigskin, forced alcohol down their throats, hanged them. Hopefully they were drunk enough where the pain wasn't too severe. Uh, and to Islam, Indian Muslims, this was um, as much a physical as much a religious insult. Um, other suspected rebels were tied to cannons, and this is where the image is here. These were rebels in white. They were tied to cannons and then blown to smithereens with their innards and blood splattered across the ground. Um, and so they were tied at point blank range. I mean, the cannon shot, I mean, it just ripped through them in an instant. In the Kwaizerba area of Lucknow, what remained was telling flattened structures, rubble, and bones strewn across courtyards. Not even religious buildings or mosques were spared. They became symbolic targets of retribution. Religions tend to do this to one another. So it's not like, you know, these Christian, Protestant, um, Englishmen were, you know, the worst in the world. I mean, the Muslims had done the same to Christians in the past. Uh, you know, certainly, and I mean, Muslims are still doing that to Christian um, um, churches in regions in which they are conquering as well to this day. So, but to top it all off, the British arrested the Mughal emperor who had been put in place by the rebels. Only a few years prior, the British would have shown respect and granted the emperor dignity in the Persian language. But uh, Bahadur uh, Shah Zafar was a reluctant emperor and was nearly eight years old at the time. When the British marched in, they manhandled him and simply told him he was under arrest. The British did pension him off, though, and exiled him to the Burmese port city of Rangoon under British surveillance. Um, He was the last symbol of an older era, which was now gone. Excuse me. In 1857, uh, 1857, excuse me, was neither a national revolt nor an, imil- an isolated military mutiny. That's just to wrap it up. We're just about done. It was both a patriotic uprising and a regionally specific movement, which quickly petered out. It contained elements of a somewhat proto-nationalism, but not enough to carry the whole of India. Uh, unlike China, which we'll discuss at some point soon, that <laughs> they really kind of they took one particular event which we'll get into and nationalized over it and it's created this now super threat the world has to face as we speak one effect of the uprising however was that the british began to question and reverse the liberal reformist impulse that had dominated since the 1820s the idea that meddling in indian religious and cultural sensitivities for the sake of improving india was now gone it had just caused far too much trouble this then 
I ushered in a new attitude of caution and conservatism. It did not mean that the British suddenly became nice, sympathetic rulers. They remained self-convinced of their right to rule India, but the racial edge now stood out. They felt more convinced than ever about their own superiority. Tales of supposed Indian barbarity, such as the slaughter of women and children, fed the expanding balloon of British imperial hubris for the next hundred years. They would not gain, the Indians would not gain um, independence until the 1950s early 1960s, um, and, and, and further exacerbated notions, exacerbated, exaster, you know the word, notions of Indian racial inferiority, inferiority. <laughs> I've been lecturing for way too long today, uh, which made the British more racist and shape how the British administered India as late as the 1940s. There were also, however, some crucial military changes. Britain refused India with, or infused, excuse me, India with even more European troops. Indians were barred from handling our artillery. The entire countryside was disarmed. Confisc the English confiscated nearly 3.5 million guns by 1858. Hoarders of guns, those who kept guns, were either slapped with a heavy, with a hefty fine, 100 lashes, or seven years imprisonment. Since the army, which had you know, which was really the final guarantor, 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 guarantor of British rule in India had rebelled. Significant changes were also made with them. All the high caste recruits from the Gangetic, uh, Gangetic Plain in the north were no longer deemed trustworthy. In their, oops, come on. In their place, the Punjabis, the Nepalese Gurkhas became a larger part, the, the more central and southern part uh, became a larger part of the army. The British increasingly saw the simple soldiers of Nepal, uh, Nepal mountains and the Punjab's plains as more trustworthy, manly, and importantly, less likely to rebel. Uh, the events of 1857 and 58 also changed Britain's constitutional relationship with India. In 1858, the East India Company was abolished through the Government of India Act. This act was the end formally of company rule and the contradiction of the, quote, sovereign merchant or merchant sovereign paradigm. It cost nearly 50 million pounds of sterling to suppress the, iron, uh, the uprising. And it was not so much that it bankrupted the company, but more than that the contradiction of company rule nearly threatened British interests in India. So the ambiguity of trading company exercising political powers was finally over. However, it didn't mean that English control obviously would end until the um, until English uh, Indian um, independence, uh, which it was 40, 1947. What was I thinking? Late 50s, 60s. So the company was replaced with Crown Wool. India was now a proper colony of Britain. Uh, this began then the period known as the British Raj or the rule of India, and would last until 1947 when India would be able to gain independence. So after 1858. The British would forsake any further expansion. They forswore any further territorial annexations, and surprisingly, they would keep their word up until they left nearly 90 years later. All right, ladies and gentlemen. That was fun. I love this era in history. I can't tell you. Um, so I had no idea how that was how long it was gonna last. I thought it was actually gonna last a little bit longer, so I guess you have a little bit of free time. Um, please, you know, find a subject here that you find interesting and just study a little bit more. You know, it's, there's so much to this history that I can't even get to. I mean, as I've said before, the Mughal Empire could be an entire semester. The British Raj could be an entire semester of teaching, and you get just a couple of brief lectures. So just, you know, take a little bit of time here and find a documentary to watch um, or find, you know, a chapter in the textbook to read on this subject and just kind of gain a little bit more information. Be, I promise you, you'll be very well entertained and obviously educated. So to that end, Blaze will be born soon, sometime in the next day or so, um, and I can't bloody wait. I can't wait to see you guys again. Obviously, I was going to say in person, but over Zoom, I'll definitely have some pictures to show you guys. So I love you all, as always. Have a great weekend, although when you see this, the weekend will be over. But I hope you had a great weekend. Have a great rest of the week. I can't wait to see you guys. Peace.